have in a book if you want to look in a book or whatever. <clears throat> Good-looking crowd. Amen. Good-looking. Good to have y'all with us today. Uh, looking at announcements, <clears throat> of course, we have uh, prayer meetings. Uh, men's is December the 7th. It's on a Tuesday night. We have them on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock at the church, and we sincerely invite every man in the church to come and join us. Uh, uh, it's usually three of us, but we can use a whole lot more. God would like to hear from you, too. And the ladies is on a Monday night, which is December the 6th at 7, at the home of Janice Hill this week. <clears throat> coming up tonight, what's coming up tonight? Children's program. I know that. I want 
Jessica. And none of them, all of them looking around like, what's coming up tonight? <laughs> yeah, we got the children and youth presenting their Christmas program in the activity building at 6.30 tonight. And everyone is invited. So come out to that. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, they always do a great job. Uh, this afternoon, she put in here 6, but I changed that to 5.30 deacons meeting. Give us a little more time to not be late for the program. Uh, our Lottie Moon post office. Don't forget to check it each week. I noticed out there this morning there's several cards in there already. But uh, it's a good thing that it overflows a lot. But go by each Sunday and, and check it out and see if you've got something. It's 10 cents a card to a church family. And all of that goes to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, adults, we're having a church family Christmas program. Kids too. Yeah, church family. But it's for kids and adults. Uh, Sunday morning, December the 19th at 11 a.m. And we ask the families to sing together. When you come up here, be nice to one another while you're singing. <laughs> But if you don't have, uh, you know, if you're by yourself, don't have uh, your family to sing with you, we can uh, uh, fix that problem. We'll let you sing with someone else, other group, whatever. But uh, let us know, Bobby and Madonna and myself, if you uh, have got a song to sing. We're trying to... Uh, <clears throat> based it around the birth of Jesus. So uh, songs out of the hymnal, and we will arrange them to, like I said, coordinate with the Christmas story. Anything else? And don't stay away because of that. We want everybody to participate. Even old John there, he's going to sing. <laughs> I'll sing the best. <laughs> I don't know, that's a pretty hard song to sing. <laughs> but anyway, we hope you will join us in that and uh, uh, help us celebrate. 86, a little town of Bethlehem. <laughs>
offertory hymn, We Three Kings. So, let's stand as we sing. And sing a little louder on this one. I can't hardly hear you. I know I'm getting deaf, but... <laughs> See if we can sing all five verses. We probably got never done We. take up our offering for us. Tony, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we Lord, thank you and praise you, Lord, for who you are, Lord, for the price you paid on the cross for us, Lord. I ask you to bless this offering. Lord, help us spread the good news of Christ. I ask you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Amen. <clears throat> There's no children's church this morning, so I'm going to ask the children that you sit real quiet and listen to what Brother John has to say this morning. Amen. can't scare me with kids you got you got to meet my bunch <laughs> okay then you'll then you'll just bless God for yours okay <laughs> amen it's good to see everybody here today are you glad to be here amen. I'd rather be here than have a root canal amen <laughs> I would too <laughs> you know there are so many wonderful stories within the story of the nativity uh, stories within stories, and I, I love those. I love this time of year because I get to preach on these. And uh, there, there are several things, there are about three things about this time of year that I really enjoy. One is the groceries. Let's be honest. Y'all Baptist or what? Okay, I, I enjoy the food, I really do. Uh, went to my doctor this week, he said, John, for a man your age, don't you love it when they say that? Uh, you're doing pretty good. There's just too much of you. <laughs> I said, well, it's your fault, first of all, for scheduling my appointment right after Thanksgiving. Uh, number two, Christmas is coming up, so don't expect things to clear up till January. Amen. Uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy the music. I love these Christmas carols. Uh, they're special because we sing them only once a year. I was doing a revival in July down in... Uh, in uh, Louisiana, uh, one July a number of years ago, a music director was a good friend of mine. We sang Joy to the World right in the middle of July. He, he said, if it's good enough for December, it's good enough for July, you know? And I love the scriptures uh, surrounding the birth of Christ. Uh, it's so wonderful. These stories that are from the scripture, which are first of all so true and yet so blessed, and they, they touch our hearts and I wanted to talk about something that captivated me years ago. Uh, when I was a, a much younger man, I was captivated by the story of what we come, have come to know as the wise men. They're kind of enigmatic in that we don't know much about them. I mean, it's, uh, there's very little there. And a lot of what we do think we know about them, we really don't know. <laughs> Because there, there, there are truths that come out in this as you, as you look at it uh, that uh, kind of set us straight on all of this. So let's, let's read in Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, the first 11 verses. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he that has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And then, all ha then he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and inquired of them where the Christ would be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gold frankincense, and myrrh. 
Who were these men? Well, it's pretty evident from everything that we can determine about them. They were magi. They were a priestly class of people that uh, occupied the land of the Babylonian Empire and later the Persian Empire. Uh, they were men who were men of renown as far as their knowledge was concerned. Uh, they knew the signs of the times. They knew the stars. They were stargazers. Uh, they didn't have any street lights or anything blocking out the stars in those days. And, and uh, in Babylon, they built big towers for no other purpose except to stay on top of those towers and to observe the stars. And so when something new appeared in the sky, they spotted it as being something very extraordinary. And another question you might want to ask is, how did they know that that was something that announced the birth of Jesus? Well, remember there was a group of people who had been in captivity in Babylon once upon a time. There was a fellow by the name of Daniel, uh, Belteshazzar, as he was called in the Babylonian tongue. And uh, he was elevated to the position of being a vizier in the court of the king. And the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that Daniel was placed over the magi, the wise men of the day. So they heard probably even from the lips of Daniel, and it was passed on through the generations about the prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah. Needless to say, when they saw that star in the sky, they marveled at it because it was something that had never been there before. It is something that has never been there since. I saw a post on Facebook the other day that somebody said, well, the star of Bethlehem is going to be visible for the first time in 1,200 years, and I'm yelling back through the phone because nobody will interview me on anything. I'm saying, no, it's not. Because I really believe that that was a very special creation for a very special purpose, and when it fulfilled its purpose, it no longer existed. And so it led those men to where Christ was. How many of them were they? We don't know. We really don't know. We give the number three because of the number of gifts that are enumerated here in Scripture. Uh, we don't know their names, although a church tradition somewhere back in about the third century gave them the names of Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. I just call them George, Frank, and Leroy. You know, that, that's, that rolls off my tongue a whole lot better. And um, really, folks, it wasn't exactly like we picture it because three men on camelback. First of all, a camel is the most honorary critter on the face of the earth. You think mules are honorary. I've ridden both, okay? And uh, camels are honorary. Second thing was you didn't venture off into the desert because that's where thieves were. That's where the robbers were. And you certainly didn't go there with, with uh, satchels full of expensive gifts like gold and frankincense and myrrh. In fact, if you look at some of the early church historians, uh, there's a guy by the name of Pliny the Elder who writes that when they arrived in Jerusalem, they brought with them a contingent of Persian cavalry that was so large it threatened the garrison of Rome that was stationed there in Jerusalem. And that's one reason why Par Herod was so paranoid about this besides learning about another king. Uh, Parod, he was kind of a paranoid guy anyway, and when he heard about this, it shook him to his core. And he asked him, when did this star appear? And afterward, he issued an order for every boy child to be killed under the age of two. And so it was a period of time in there. Did they come to the, to the manger? No, they really didn't. The Bible says they came to a house, and the word there is used not babe, but young child. Does that cast any shadows on the story? Not at all. Fact is, they came. Let's don't miss that. They came, and they brought gifts, and those were meaningful gifts, gifts that had some prophetic significance to them. The Bible tells us that they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In the biblical world, if you wanted to invest in something that was going to 
uh, be valuable and hold its value over an extended period of time, one of the things that you would invest in would be precious uh, ointments and spices and things of that nature. They were the things that were going to hold their value over a period of time. If you'll remember when the woman came and took the, the box of ointment and broke it open and poured it on the feet of Jesus and dried his feet with her hair, Judas is the one who said, well, that was a big waste. We could have taken that box of ointment and we could have sold it for so much. It's, it's worth a whole bunch of money. And she, here she has, she just poured it out. Well, they brought costly gifts. The first of the gifts that they brought was this, gold. You know, even now, if you listen to these guys on television and so forth that are supposed to be the prognosticators of economic wealth and so forth, they'll tell you to invest in gold. For some reason or another, all through human history, gold has been a very valuable commodity and in the ancient world, it was mostly associated with kings. Kings had gold. In the 1920s, when Howard Carter found the, the tomb of King Tut in the Valley of the Kings, he knocked a little hole through the door and he stuck a candle through there and somebody said, what do you see? And he said, wondrous things. Everywhere, the glint of gold. They buried all that gold with the king because that was his gold. It was the gift of kings. I looked up the uh, royal crown. I've seen several royal crowns in, in my travels in Europe. I looked up the uh, coronation crown for Queen Elizabeth, the setting queen of, of Great Britain right now. Her royal crown was five pounds of gold. I was sitting there thinking, my old country boy way of thinking, that's like having a sack of meal sitting on your head. That's a lot of gold, isn't it, folks? It's the gift of royalty. It's the gift of a king. We may have a president, but we've got a king. Amen? And our king is the king of kings. A number of years ago, in fact, I was, I was thinking about it uh, from the time that message was first preached. Dr. S.M. Lockridge, who was one of the preeminent African-American preachers of the 20th century, preached a message in 1970 called, That's My King. You can still listen to it on YouTube. I'd urge you to do that because what I'm going to tell you this morning is not going to do, you just, do it justice. But I got a printout of part of that that I just want to share with you this morning uh, because he extols the virtue of the king we have. You know, we live in a world where everything is kind of up for grabs right now, isn't it? Uh, you know, I was looking at a map of the world the other day. Uh, those are not the countries that I learned when I was in geography in the fifth and sixth grade. Uh, it's a whole, whole different ball game, isn't it? A lot of the countries that I, I memorized and had to put on maps when I was in school, those countries don't even exist anymore, and those borders have been erased. And now there are new countries with new names that are out there. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that things change. Not only do borders change, but kings change and presidents change and prime ministers change and everything's up for grabs. But I've, I've got great confidence in telling you here today that as a Christian, as a born again child of the living God, you have a king who always was, who is, and who always will be. Listen to this, if you will. S.M. Lockridge said... My king was born king. My, the Bible says my king is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's the king of Israel. That is a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Now that's my king. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is the only one in whom there is no me me means of measure that can define his limitless love. 
no far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his endless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere, eternally steadfast, immortally graceful. He is imperially powerful, impartially merciful. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's august and unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is supreme. He is preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature, the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the core and necessity of spiritual religion. Now, that's my king. And we go on. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Well, he's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He is available to the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He is our guard and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. Well, that's my king. Do you know him? Well, my king is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom, the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace, the roadway of righteousness, and the highway of holiness. My king is the gateway of glory, the master of the mighty, the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes, the leader of the legislators, the overseer of the overcomers, the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. He's incomprehensible. He's indescribable. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. <laughs> Don't you love that? Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him and death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. <laughs> That's my king. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he has no predecessor, and he has no successor. There was nobody before him. There will be nobody after him. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. Amen. Amen. The Bible says... Great is the Lord. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. And after you get through with all the forevers, then amen. That was a word about the king. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a king who will be king when there's nothing else standing. We have a king who has always been and who always will be. We have a king who will not abdicate his throne. He has not surrendered any of his power. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And unless you think in despair that things are falling apart right now, I want you to know something. It's going according to his plan. It's going to play out. 
And in the end result is going to be this, that we're going to be worshiping the king forever. Isn't he a matchless king? No wonder they brought him gold. For he is the king of kings and lord of lords. But they also brought him frankincense. You say, what's frankincense? Well, frankincense is a fragrant smell. My wife loves essential oils. I always thought essential oil meant bacon grease. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm kind of silly that way. But she'll burn those in a little thing, you know, or fumigate them or whatever you do. You know what I'm talking about, ladies. Uh, and it makes the house smell nice. And she'll, she'll do frankincense sometimes. She'll do myrrh, you know, and, and things like that. It really, it really smells nice in there, you know. Uh, I, just, I just don't walk in, you know, and say, my, that smells yummy. I, I don't do that, you know. Uh, but it smells good. Frankincense was an integral part. In fact, it was the biggest part of the incense that was burned in the temple. Within the temple, there was an article of furniture called the altar of incense. And incense was burnt on that table continually. And as the smoke rose up from it, it represented the prayers of God's people being able to access God. And the Bible says that God had given a command that only that particular type of incense should be burned on the altar of incense. Well, Aaron's sons, Aaron was the first high priest, the brother of Moses, and he had two sons by the name of Nadab and Abihu. And they, they, they ran out of the uh, incense they were supposed to be burning, and they said, well, you know what? We'll just put in a substitute. We'll, we'll get a reasonable facsimile thereof. And I, and I want to pause right there and say, there are no substitutes when it comes to God. You do it his way, the way he says do it. And when they burned that foreign incense on the altar of incense, it cost them their lives because they brought something holy, unholy, before a holy God. That frankincense is indicative of the fact that Jesus is our high priest. Over in Genesis chapter 18, you find that Abraham encountered another fellow that's sort of an enigma. His name was Melchizedek. And as Abraham was journeying, uh, he ran into this man by the name of Melchizedek. And by the way, this was before Moses. This was before there was a priesthood. This was before there was a tabernacle. This was before there were sacrifices. But the Bible says that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. He was the priest king of Salem, which is now Jerusalem. And Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And then over in the Psalms, Psalm 111, I do believe, David said this about Christ, that he has made you, that is Christ, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek not having an earthly lineage that was passed from one generation to the next. My daddy was high priest, I'm high priest, my son will be high priest. But one that has been established by the authority of God himself. And the Bible tells us over here in the book of Hebrews, if I can get to that place real quick. The Bible tells us this, that seeing we have a great high priest, and that is Jesus who has passed from the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. You know what he did? The high priest was given the job in the tabernacle and later the temple of taking the, the offering of sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat to purge the sins of the people. That was done once a year. Nobody but the high priest could go in there. But you know what the Bible tells us? When Jesus died on the cross... 
it says that symbolically he entered into the Holy of Holies of heaven. See, the temple was a picture of something that exists in heaven. I don't understand all that. I'm glad I've got a God that I can't understand, aren't you? And the Bible says that Jesus entered in there and what he did was he purged that mercy seat of heaven with his own blood and made the final, the last, never to be done again offering for sin. The debt's been paid. When he was on the cross, he cried out to telestai, which means it's paid in full. Our great high priest, who is also our king, who is also our sacrifice, went into the holy of holies of heaven and stood there before God and poured out his blood on the mercy seat of heaven so that you and I by faith might be able to come and have our sins forgiven and our iniquity taken away. What a great high priest. You know, when you think about a priest, what do you think of? That's someone that, that stands before God on your behalf, right? Well, listen, Jesus stands before God on our behalf even until this day. The Bible says this, that if we sin, and it's not a matter of if, right? It's just a matter of how late in the morning I get around to it, right? Uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And you know what he's doing right now today? He is interceding on your behalf and on mine before the throne of the Father. What a great high priest we have. So they brought him gold because he was a king. They brought him frankincense because he was the great high priest. And they brought him myrrh. What is myrrh? Myrrh is another fragrance. It's an oil. And it is, it is the oil of death. It was that which was used to anoint the bodies of the dead as they were prepared for burial. When Jesus was crucified on that Friday... The Bible says that it was about three o'clock in the afternoon when he cried out with a loud voice and gave up the spirit into God's hands. According to Jewish law, a dead body could not be out over the Sabbath. Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday, ends at sundown on Saturday. And so his burial was hasty. They took him and they wrapped him in the grave clothes, basically draped him. And they put him on that stone slab in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And they rolled the stone across the door. They sealed it with the official seal and put guards over it, lest any man should come and steal his body. Thinking that on the first day of the week, on Sunday morning, that's why we celebrate the resurrection on that Sunday morning. Because the women uh, came to prepare him finally for burial. They were going to roll the stone back, they were going to go in, and they were going to do a proper job of it. But when they got there, guess what? He didn't need it. They found the grave clothes that he was wrapped in, folded up, lying on that stone table that he was placed on. And they brought with them everything for burial, including... Myrrh. You know what I've always wondered? I've always wondered, was that the same box of myrrh that was brought to them when these magi visited Christ? I believe it probably was. Jesus became our substitute. The Bible says this, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way, yet the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity 
of us all. Do you realize something, ladies and gentlemen? When Jesus died on the cross, you were there. You say, I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm not talking about physically. You were there in the mind, will, and purpose of God. Let me tell you something else that was present there. Your sin was present there. Isn't it amazing about the God we serve? That he chose to love a creation that he knew was going to rebel against him. That he chose to love a people that he knew were going to sin against him and break his heart. That tells us something of the love, grace, and mercy of God, does it not? And the Bible says that when Jesus went to that cross, that every bit of the sin of every human being who ever had lived, was living, or would ever live on planet earth was laid on him. The eyes of God looked away. The Holy Spirit looked away as Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he died on the cross. See, these, these men knew something. They knew that as they looked down into the fair, beautiful face of that young child that they were visiting, that they were bringing gifts to, that it, even though it was a glorious moment, there was a shadow there across the manger, across this young child, there was the shadow of a cross. He took God's judgment so that we would not be judged. And you know what he did? He presented himself, listen to this, this don't get you hallelujah going, there's nothing that will. He presented himself before God as us so that we might present ourselves before God as him. And the only hope of the human race, I like what the old hymn says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You know, we're embarking on a celebration. To me, it just kind of snuck up on me. I mean, has it done that to y'all? I mean, I'm just not even over Thanksgiving good. But we start having Christmas in October, according to Walmart anyway. Amen? Used to, we had to wait till the Sears catalog came. Then it got to be Christmas. And... Everybody, you know, I, I've got friend, young, younger friends, they, they put up, I think my daughter did, put up their Christmas trees like at middle of October. I can't even find mine. I don't know where it is. If I never had a tree, if I never had a light, if I never had another gift, I still got plenty to celebrate. Because this is not about whether I get what I want or whether I buy the right gift for somebody else or whether or not I get to stuff myself beyond, you know, in, put myself in a food coma when we, when we have Christmas or, or all, any, any of those things that we do. And I'm not against any of those things. I'm just for Jesus. And I'm, I'm at the place in my life uh, We've sat around, Chris and I, and talked about this so many times. You know, we don't need anything more than what we've got. Honest to goodness, we don't need a thing. I can't think of anything that I actually want. I, 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 I can't. I want a 400-pound doctor, but nobody's called me and told me they got one, so, I, you know... Wait till y'all get where I am. Y'all will understand the agony of being told there's too much of you. Uh, all I want to do, seriously, is just to praise God for his great love for me. Because, you know, listen to me. You know who Christmas was really about? You and me. Christ came because of us. He did. He came because we were in our sin. 
and we needed a savior. And God has made him king and priest and sacrifice for our sins. How blessed are we? How blessed are we? You know what I really pray for you this year? First of all, if you don't know Christ, this is going to be my prayer for you. That you'll finally get the gift you really need. What a great time of year to come to know the Lord. You know, you know what you'd be able to do for the first time? Celebrate Christmas for what it really is. When you know Christ, you can do that. You can praise God for it. And ladies and gentlemen, let's don't get caught up too much in all this kind of stuff. Amazon doesn't make Christmas. Jesus does. Wally World doesn't make Christmas. Jesus does. And let's just celebrate it. Let's just rejoice in Christ our Savior and the fact that God sent him into the world for us. Would you bow with me? Father, I want to pray that you'll open our hearts this morning to see the immensity of your love for us, the vastness of your mercy, the ever-extending virtue of your love, which you pour down on us in full measure, and you certainly did when you sent your only begotten Son into the world as a human baby to die for our sins. I pray for anyone here this morning, Father, that does not know Christ, that they would come to know him, and that way they would be able to celebrate with us the most wonderful gift ever given, and that is the gift of your Son. And I would pray here this morning that we as believers would not lose sight but that we would rejoice evermore in the fact that we have a Savior who came into the world to save us from our sins. Lord, you have been gracious beyond measure, loving beyond any ability to be able to express. You are merciful beyond imagination, and you're gracious to the extent that you would forgive our sins and make us your own dear children. Oh God, how I pray today that your spirit will move and that you will cause us to worship and praise as we rightly should. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please.